So now we come to the difference between oral and injectable formulations. In one case, the orals. It's up to the person with this problem to volitionally take these pills. Every day. Every day. Right. Injectables, not so much. Right. What, are the, what are the injectable formulations out there? How long do they last? So we have a range of formulations now, anywhere from every other week, once a month, once every other month, to once every three months. Okay. So there's really a range of options. And I think you know, pe people are going to vary in terms of what they think is best for them. Obviously, they're going to work with the clinical team to decide what's the best, uh, what's the best approach. But the difference, as you suggested, the difference between taking pills every day where you have to make a conscious decision to take the medicine, you have to remember to take it, you have to be organized to take it, et cetera, et cetera, you have to have it in your possession, is so different than having someone give you an injection once a month or once every mm -hmm. two months. It's a completely different scenario. So it, adherence is better with the injectable. Adherence is much better. And not only is the adherence better, but it puts the clinical team in a completely different position in terms of knowing whether or not you're taking your medicine. Because this has been shown in many research studies that clinicians will usually overestimate the degree to which their patients are taking their medicine. Because right. we all think we're, we're great doctors. We have terrific you know, therapeutic well, relationships. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I'm perfect. <laughs> well, we actually did a study where we asked doctors, so what do you think the average rate of compliance is based on the literature? These were experts right. in the treatment of, of schizophrenia. What do you think the average rates of compliance are based on the literature? And they gave us a number. And then we said, well, what about amongst your patients? Oh. And needless to say, the latter was a much higher estimate than the former. So I think we all have this sort of narcissistic whatever that, you know, our patients are going to be adherent because, of course, we're, you know. Well, we all live in Lake Wobegon. You know, all the women are beautiful, all the men are tall, and all the children are better than average. Absolutely. And everyone's <laughs> adherent. So and everyone's adherent. So, you know, I think this has been shown in so many studies. So, you know, one of the challenges is that physicians have to realize that they are not very good at determining whether their patients mm -hmm. are adherent. Because what do they do? They ask the person, are you taking right. your medicine? Right. And the person may not even remember when they've missed it or when they've not missed it. And it's not that our patients are, are like, you know, lying to us. They often just don't really know whether the they take it. The capacity among human beings for self-delusion is infinite. Yes, absolutely. And you know, the, the other part of this is, you get to the end of the month, you have to refill that script. And uh, maybe the pharmacy's closed. Maybe you forgot. Maybe the insurance company has changed the formulary and you need a different brand name or a generic. And it's a hassle. That's right. So all of those things come into play. But in addition to improving the likelihood of adherence, we're also improving the likelihood that the clinical team knows what's going on. So one of the things that we experience when a patient comes to the emergency room in a psychotic state is we're going to ask ourselves, well, was he or was she taking the medicine as prescribed or not. That's very important information. So we did a study where we actually drew blood levels of the antipsychotic drug when people came to the emergency room. We compared the results of the blood level assay to the opinion of the doctors who evaluated the patient. That's a nasty test. You know nasty that? test. And needless to say, there was not good agreement. So it just, it shows. And that's, you know, that's a critical decision point for the clinical team to, you know, that your, your actions, your recommendations are going to be very different if you know that the patient relapsed because they weren't taking medicine or because they were taking medicine. Now, if you take a look at the injectables, is it fair to divide them into various classes, shorter acting, kind of medium acting, and then longer acting? Well, I think, as you said, the interval varies. So, you know, you might have a drug that is given every other week or every four weeks or every eight weeks or... Uh, every three months. And that's, you know, so that's based on the pharmacokinetics of specific drugs. And I think the great thing is that we have some choices. Now, let me, let me use a non-precise term. I'm going to use the word efficacy. And I don't mean this statistically. I don't have a p-value for it. But if you have a long-acting injectable versus a shorter-acting injectable, what is the efficacy? Compare them. Uh, is it better to give one shot you said three months mm -hmm. was one of them. So there's no difference in the overall effectiveness in terms right. of uh, preventing relapse. Let's put it that way. But the one, one advantage of the longer interval is that if the patient misses an injection, they can go for a longer period of time until their next injection. And that, that's helpful because I think 
one of the things, one of the advantages of the long-acting formulations, as I said before, is that you know we know whether or not the patients received it. Because sure. If they don't receive it, we actually have some time to intervene. Mm -hmm. And we could, you know, we can call the family or significant other. We can do a home visit. We can do whatever's necessary. When someone stops taking their oral medicine, we usually, we have no idea. We right. don't know. And it's out of their system pretty quickly. So it seems to me, based on what you've told me, the risk of relapse is lower. Not, not because the risk of relapse is any different when the meds are all gone, but the risk, the risk of relapse is lower with the longer acting injectables because you have more time to regroup. Right. If you look at it that way, if you're including the period of time after yes. it's stopped, then yes, that would be true. But during the time that someone is actually receiving their injections as prescribed, we don't see a difference. And the risk of relapse with the longer acting injectables compared to oral agents, again, not while on the meds, but over the, the, whole, the whole gamut. Yes. My is, guess is, from what you've told me, that the risk of relapse is much lower yes. with the longer-acting drugs because they're on the drugs more reliably, more predictably. Yes. I mean, there are, there are different methodologies that have been used to study that, but in my opinion, the data is pretty overwhelming that the risk of relapse and, and rehospitalization is lower with the long-acting formulations than with the oral drugs. There are a few randomized controlled trials that don't, don't show that, but one of the problems when you do a standard RCT is that the participation in the trial itself really changes the ecology of care. So you're now in a clinical trial, you've signed a consent form, you're being assessed frequently, you have now a relationship with the research assistant, the research coordinator who calls you on the phone and reminds you of your, all of these things. You know, so when you're studying adherence, I think you have to be very careful that the study itself doesn't change Ah, but studies always change everything. They do. Study patients always do the best. No, that's true. They get the best care, in my opinion. Sure. But there are other ways of looking at it. You can do naturalistic cohort studies with large databases. You can do mirror image studies. So those are more, I think, approximate better what goes on in the real world. You can do large, simple trials. And so when we do those kinds of studies, the results are pretty compelling, favoring the long-acting injectable formulation.